Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Stephen Krieger, a professor of neurology at the Corian Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis at Mount Sinai in New York. Hi, I'm Dr. Alana Katzand, an associate professor of neurology, also at the Corian Goldsmith Dickinson Center for MS here at Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, Dr. Katzand and I are going to talk a little bit about new research in diet and nutrition in multiple sclerosis, which has been a big topic and something I think that our patients uh, ask us about very, very commonly. And now there's emerging science and emerging data to help guide our nutritional and diet conversations with our patients. So maybe Dr. Katzen, you can start by telling us a little bit about the state of the science in diet and nutrition research in MS. Sure. So I agree. This is a super important topic. It's something our patients ask us about all the time. And that's actually what inspired me to start working in this space. Um, you know, it's, it's been a long road, but I think we are finally starting to make some progress. There have been a number of studies published um, over the last few years that had given us each, you know, small insights, um, a bunch of different pilot studies, including one that we published on some different dietary patterns and um, how those potentially can have an impact on MS symptoms, um, as well as some observational studies. And we can talk a little bit about uh, the work that was recently presented at AAN today. That's great. I mean, I think diet is notoriously difficult to study, um, to make for robust and reproducible results and, and outcomes. Um, but as you said, it has come a long way in, in the field of MS. I think for a long time, there were diets for which there was not really data to support them. Um, but now we have, uh, we, we definitely have some. So yeah, why don't we talk a little bit about um, you know, your work uh, in, in diet and nutrition and MS, and, and in particular, you can tell us about the update that you presented as a platform presentation at the American Academy of Neurology meeting uh, in Seattle in, uh, in April of uh, 2022. Sure. So um, we've been interested in looking at Mediterranean type diets for some time now um, for a couple different reasons. One is just in terms of you know, generalizability and ability of people to do something and something that's good for their general health, we think this is a good pattern to look at. Um, there's very good research at this point establishing general health benefits of this type of diet. It's something the whole household can do. It's something that's good for everyone. Um, we did run a pilot study a few years ago looking at feasibility of studying this pattern in clinical trials. Um, adherence was excellent. Um, you know, people didn't find it too difficult to do. It doesn't require any, you know, specialized foods to buy. Um, so it's budget friendly. And um, we also published a paper last year um, showing a connection between uh, a Mediterranean type pattern called the MIND diet score and uh, MRI outcomes. Um, specifically there, we were looking at thalamic volume in people with early MS, and we saw an association between thalamic volume and the MIND score, which was really interesting to us and people who were very early on in their disease course. And so those things kind of inspired us to really focus in on that pattern. So the work that we presented at AAN was an observational study looking at our clinic population. So we used our neuropsych clinic um, where we do a comprehensive annual assessment, as you know, and we refer all of our patients there. We try to really make use of the program. Um, it's wonderful for patients and clinicians in terms of just keeping an eye from a more detailed perspective than, you know, just the clinical visit and the MRI, but really doing some higher challenge tasks for people, asking them to fill out surveys. And so we have a whole bunch of different outcomes that we, that we measure there. And so what we did was we embedded within that a dietary screener. And the one that we used um, was the METAS, which is the Medi Mediterranean diet scale. It's a 14 item scale and it assigns a zero or a one for each item, depending on, um, you know, whether people meet the threshold for whichever score. And so um, there are questions about olive oil, about fruits and vegetable consumption, nuts. And then on the flip side of that, butter, pastries, um, sugary beverages, things like that. And so you end up with this score. And so then what we're able to do is look at associations. So we ultimately looked at a sample of uh, 563 people. We had this score done on everyone. So we don't introduce biases about people who volunteered or didn't volunteer for a diet study because we made everyone fill it out when they came to clinic, right. um, which is really helpful because we were capturing not only data 
on diet, but also on many other lifestyle factors and all kinds of things that we're going to um, use to help our patients going forward. So we looked at how that diet, how that diet data uh, associates with the outcomes that we collected. So our major disability outcome was the multiple sclerosis functional composite. As you know, that's comprised of the nine hole peg test, the time 25 foot walk, and the simple digit modality test. So we get a nice look at sensory motor function, functioning and cognitive functioning all in one as a composite. We also looked at them separately. And then we looked at a whole bunch of patient reported outcomes uh, secondarily. So we looked at fatigue, um, we looked at mood, uh, we looked at you know, the MSIS, which gives you an overall you know, look at how symptoms affect daily life. And we, we found some really interesting results. Um, I think the biggest thing about this study is that because these are people who came through our clinic and because we knew we were gonna be focused on not only on diet, but other factors, um, and looking at prognosis over time, we collected a lot of really detailed information about people. So we collected detailed demographic information and um, health information as well. So we collected information on um, you know, age, sex. We, we developed a composite index for socioeconomic status that we paid really careful attention to, um, including like a neighborhood deprivation index. Um, we collected information on people's uh, weight so we can calculate their and heights, so we can calculate the body mass index um, on smoking, on hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes. So we collected information on a ton of different factors, sure. exercise. And then after we controlled for all of these factors, what we found was a very robust association between their Mediterranean diet score and their level of disability. So MSFC was our primary outcome, but uh, the association was also significant for all of the patient reported outcomes that we looked at. And very interestingly, this withstood correction for multiple comparisons. Um, we also reran the MSFC analysis for disability after uh, uh, putting fatigue and mood into the model, thinking that you know that might affect people's performance, and it did. Um, but the association was still there and still pretty robust. So those and were so, kind of the, the main findings. And so you really found an association here between both measurable disability and patient reported outcomes that showed that the more they adhere to this Mediterranean style diet and stay away from some of the bad actors, the bad nutritional actors that you mentioned, uh, butter, processed food, sugar, um, the more favorable those scores were. Yes, exactly. Now this is a cross-sectional study. It's a single time point. Um, it's an observational study. So of course, in terms of the conclusions, you know, it's limited um, because what we need to do is look at how people do over time and we need to do interventional studies. Um, but we thought it was pretty, it was pretty powerful stuff in terms of an observation. And, and like I said, um, I think, you know, the big things about this study are we had an objective outcome measure um, we had everyone fill out this survey, so we didn't have issues with biases and dropouts and things like that. Right. Um, and we really collected in a very robust way, uh, a lot of demographic and health related information for covariates. Even when you do that, there's always, you know, potential for unmeasured compounders, but. Right. And as you said, you know, the Mediterranean style diet is an achievable one and something that, as I think you mentioned, families can all kind of get on board with. It is a generally healthy and health positive diet. Um, there are other diets that are being studied in multiple sclerosis, including the ketogenic diet or keto, which also had a presentation at the American Academy of Neurology meeting. Um, I don't know, briefly, do you, can, you, can you summarize a little bit of what the folks in Virginia who did that study were, were looking at there? Yes, so Dr. Brunton gave that presentation on ketogenic diet and his group ran an interventional study, which was an open label study of about 65 people uh, with MS who were assigned to follow, who volunteered to follow a ketogenic diet for six months. Um, so the study was, was, uh, was really interesting. I think they did a really nice job with it. Um, it's an open label study, so of course, limited there in terms of interpretation, but uh, they were able to show that most people, I think it was 50, 57 or so of people were able to achieve you know, reasonable adherence and they were able to measure adherence in a way that was objective by having people um, use strips to test their urine for ketone bodies 
right? So you can look at the year and peak. Um, so, so I think that, you know, that was great in terms of ability to look at adherence, which is a really hard thing to do in, in diet studies. Um, and among the people who followed the diet, um, they had they had great outcomes um, in that uh, people had you know reductions in their body weight and their fat mass. Um, they had uh, positive changes in terms of their adipokine balance, in terms of leptin going down, adiponectin going up, um, and they had good effects on some of these same metrics that we looked at, so fatigue. Um, and mood, which are really important in people with MS. Um, and there seemed to be an effect also on some of the disability outcomes. So I think it's, you know, it's really interesting work. And I think, you know, in combination, you can say that, you know, the, the study that you've done on a very large, broad cross-section of MS patients showing those sorts of benefits with a Mediterranean style diet um, are being seen there in what is in essence a much more restrictive diet and, and different in terms of the food groups that are being recommended. A, a keto diet, of course, is you know very low carbohydrates, but high in fat, um, high in protein, uh, may be difficult for people to adhere to for the long term, might be challenging for families to all get on board with, uh, with that kind of diet at the same time. But I think in, in the aggregate, there's, uh, there's definitely a signal here and there's opportunity to study this in, in as you said, future interventional and, and you know, even potentially randomized trials. You've shown the possibility of that before um, to get you know, more, more definitive answers about what is the optimal diet if there is one uh, and how that can be achieved for people with MS. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's the takeaway here is that um, you know, in our study we found this these associations in their study, they did an intervention and found positive outcomes, even though it's an uncontrolled study, I think it's still important and contributes to the literature. Um, but yeah, I think the takeaway is that diet is a potentially really powerful tool that we can use. And when we're thinking about our patients with MS, yes, we've made great progress in disease modifying therapies, but they're not perfect. Um, our patients have ongoing issues um, symptomatically and from a neurodegenerative standpoint, even if we control their inflammation. And so we should be really looking at everything that we can um, to set people up for success. And so this is one, I think, of a number of tools that we should be looking to, to harness. So in our, in our final minute here, um, how do you use this with your patients? What, what's kind of the punchline of what you're telling people nowadays could be the low hanging fruit that they can do to optimize diet and MS? So what I tell people is we don't necessarily have specific evidence from any of the interventional trials that have been done because they've all been similar to this study that I just talked about, the ketogenic study, where they've been small and piloty in their design. Um, you know, we don't have specific evidence to say this particular diet is going to be a disease modifier and it's going to definitely help your prognosis in MS. But I think our observational study, as well as other work that's been done previously, what, what we can learn that we can translate now um, for our patients is to say, we think that there are certain changes that everyone can make that are going to be helpful. Um, and whether it's gonna have a specific effect on MS prognosis, that's the part that we're not entirely sure about yet, but you are going to feel better. Um, and these things are good for your general health anyway. And so I think they're reasonable to try. So the things that I emphasize with my patients, people ask, you know, what can I do? I say, if there's one thing that you can do, I, I recommend that you um, try to reduce your reliance on processed foods as much as possible, because that's something that when you look at all the different diets that are under study, um, that's something that's common to most of them actually is um, taking out the processed foods and, and adding in more things that are fresh. Um, so that's something that I really encourage people to work on. And we do have also really good research in MS showing that having diabetes or high cholesterol, being overweight are associated with worse prognosis. So, you know, anything that you can do to help avoid those complications, I think is clearly going to be a benefit. So that's kind of where, where I try to steer people at the moment. I, I appreciate that. And I think in general, um, you are perhaps a little bit stronger with your patients about their dietary choices than I am with mine. But every time I talk to you about it, I, I learn 
I learn a little something and move a little bit more in your direction. I think the balance I try to strike with my patients is I don't want them to have to think about having MS all the time. And I don't want them to have to deprive themselves of things that genuinely bring them pleasure. Um, but at the same time, as you said, taking care of MS is a long-term process. We're trying to optimize brain health for their years and decades to come. And so uh, I, I yeah. agree with you to keep them away from processed foods is a good but way. That, to... You know, and that, that I, what you just said is actually, it actually, is very consistent with everything that I've said, which is that, and that's what I love about the Mediterranean pattern is that it's not a diet. Yeah. It's a lifestyle. It's just a way of approaching food. And it's something that once you get into it and incorporate these principles into your life, it just becomes part of what you do. It's not, oh, I can have this or I can't have that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's very easy actually to find, uh, you know, foods that are enjoyable for everyone. You don't necessarily have to say like, oh, this is a no and this is a yes. And, you know, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of rules really. Um, it's just these general guiding principles people can incorporate. And what I tell people when they ask me about this, you know, well, if I stick to this, that's that. And if I don't, you know, the reward is that you feel better. Yeah. And, um, and that's actually when we ran our pilot study, that was one of the things that people told me when the study was ending and they were like, oh, you know, I, because the study was over, I went out and I ate this and this and this, and I felt so terrible the next day that I actually went back to right. following the study protocol because I just, I realized that I felt so much better on it. So that's, that's great. I, I like what you said. I'm going to use it, which is um, it's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. So yeah. we're, you're, you're advocating not just a Mediterranean diet, but live a Mediterranean lifestyle. I think we could all get behind that. Whatever that means. Um, yeah. in the US community. <laughs> so, Dr. Katzian, thank you so much for sharing uh, your work and your insights on diet. And um, from Medscape and from Mount Sinai, uh, I'm Stephen Krieger in New York.